Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jenny and I'm here today to share with you my reading wrap up for the month of November. So the first book that I finished in November is Heartberries by Therese Marie Mayotte. And um, Therese Marie is from a First Nation in British Columbia originally. But she has lived all over North America, it sounds like, um, in pursuit of her literary um, pursuits. So this is a memoir, and this is about Therese's growing up, um, her early adulthood, her the birth of her children. I listened to this on audio. It was narrated by Rainy, Rainy Fields, I think was her name. And I thought the narration was very good. Um, but this book was a book to think on. So um, it's a very serious book. It has a lot of painful, triggering situations that Therese went through in her life. And there's an afterword in which she talks about the process of writing this, a question and answer type process. And I found that to be a really interesting thing to listen to afterwards because one of the words that kept going through my head as I was listening to this memoir was raw. And she actually objects to that word. And so... I had to kind of check myself when I was listen like when after I heard that and think about my perception of her story and my um, projection onto her story of my own white privilege and things like that. So I think that um, listening to the afterward was crucial to me actually understanding where she was going with this memoir. So I think something that I perceived from it that was incorrect was that there was somehow like that there was this confessional tone and that this confessional tone meant that it had less of an intellectual intention and that's actually not the case there's a highly intellectual intention about how she wrote this memoir um, I found that her perspective was she was trying to be as objective about her perspective as possible, which I thought was really interesting. And she was not presenting things with um, a sense of sentimentality or a sense of um, seeking anything. I don't feel like she was seeking approval or seeking um, redemption or, you know, because I think sometimes memoirs can have that kind of feeling to them. I think for me, because I'm trying to decolonize myself, to knock off a lot of the edges of white supremacy that I know I in inherently carry within me and trying to educate myself properly that I feel like reading and, and accessing um, Indigenous memoir, Indigenous work is really important to me and I will keep on that path. Um, I'm curious to see what type of work um, Therese Mayo comes out with in future and whether or not I will pick it up will kind of depend on what the nature of the work is. So that's the way I felt about Heartberries and um, I will check in again with you when I have finished another book. So the first book that I finished in November is Birdie by Tracy Lindbergh. This is a... Um, Alberta-based Indigenous author and this story follows Bernice whose nickname is Birdie uh, through a very difficult time in her life. So I want to start this off by saying that I was very misled by the description of this novel. It's re really interesting to me um, that when people, whoever writes the um, synopses of novels really need to check what they're putting in there because I think if you pick the wrong parts of a novel it gives an impression that is not going to be accurate for the person reading the book. 
I was under the impression that this book was a road trip novel. It is not. Um, I was under the impression that this was kind of a quest. Bernice's quest was to go find this character from a Canadian TV show called The Beachcombers. Um, and that that was like her main goal in the story. And it's not. It's not. So I find that that kind of affected my enjoyment of the first part of the book because I was expecting something that wasn't happening and I was kind of confused. I do think that the writing style, so the writing style has a few different narrative voices, mostly Bernice, but you also get some kind of poetry um, thrown in there, kind of poetic speak, um, which is kind of this unnamed narrator and you get some kind of vignette style impressions of moments. And so I didn't find that I was able to get into that very easily um, in the first half of the book. The second half of the book changes slightly because you start to jump from perspectives of between four women. So Bernice and four other women, two are her relations and one is a friend. And I feel like that was a stronger, like once you hit that part, it really pulled you in more than the rest of the story had in the beginning. Um, and then you also, there was kind of a road trip element to it, you know, because you you find out about how Bernice got to where she is, which is basically laying in a bed, um, catatonic, I guess, to a certain degree you find out about that in snippets and in different ways and you find out her history and in snippets and in different ways and so it takes a while for that all to come together once it comes together i think it comes together quite beautifully um i really think that the la i'm really glad that i you know i cared enough about the book to keep going even though i wasn't particularly into it um at the beginning because the ending like getting through the end part of the that last half of the book was worth it and was very enjoyable um it is very hard subject matter you have um sexual abuse mental health issues um family dysfunction um there is a lot of body consciousness in here because bernice is a larger woman and so she talks about that, that comes up a lot about her body her body image versus her cousin's body image. And it's referenced a lot in the text, which I think if that is something that bothers you, then you may not enjoy this novel for that reason because it might be very triggering for you. I think that the discussion around what Bernice why Bernice had this extra weight on her and her relationship with food and her relationship with her body and herself were all very well explained in in the narrative so you understand why things are referenced so much but me I, I do think for some people it would be too much um it's also a beautiful story about healing and it's about healing in a modality that is indigenous. So it's not about um, looking at mental health through a Western medicine white lens. It's very much about um, looking to medicines, um, food and, and, and plant medicines the medicine of um, the Cree nation because um, Bernice is Cree. It, 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 that is what the story works through and I really appreciated that. I thought it, it offered another way of seeing, another um, perspective on healing and mental health that I think is important to consider because it has become such a clinical way of looking at people um and end of healing them that they need you know um western medication they need um therapy they need to go through what you know western medicine prescribes as the way to heal and i think that Br bernice in this story heals in an indigenous way um and does not you know yeah there's a lot of things that I don't want to. I don't want to go in too much about 
the plot because I do think that there's a lot of things um, in the story that are well crafted and well thought out and well explained you know they're explained in a way that that brings um that doesn't necessarily tie everything up in a neat little bow but that brings you a sense of completion of of closing a loop um that i think is really positive and uh, though you may not agree with it i think uh it certainly is a, a wonderful perspective to to put yourself into and to try to contemplate um for things that you go through in your own life so yeah that is birdie by tracy Lindbergh, my alberta read for my read across canada challenge and i will check in again with you when i have finished another book hey everyone i finished the baby on the fire escape by julie phillips yesterday and this was an absolutely fantastic read five stars um this was researched in such a fantastic way. Julie Phillips is herself a mother. She writes at the end that it took her a really long time to write this book and it's not a super long book. It's about um, 280 pages. Um, but the way she wove stories of different artists through this book was just so readable, so easy to absorb information. She would place you know, she would refer back to different people. So for instance, when she was talking about Angela Carter, she might refer back to Audre Lorde and just like relate different pieces of what Audre Lorde would be experiencing while Angela Carter is going through this certain thing. So she covers, um, mo I would say it's mostly writers. So she covers Doris Lessing, Angela Carter, um, Audre Lorde, Elizabeth Smart, who is someone that I had not heard of before, Susan Sontag, um, and also Alice Neal. This is Alice Neal's painting here. So that's, she's one painter that she spoke about. Um, Louise Bourgeois is mentioned, um, Ursula K. Le Guin. So, uh, you know, people, women, from the 20th century who were grappling with motherhood and creativity and trying to combine those two things and the kind of the evolution of um, women's control over our bodies and how that influenced the women of future generations in terms of their ability to choose motherhood in a different way from the women of the first few generations she was talking about. So women who could not control their reproductive system and uh, got pregnant despite not wanting to or um, married to kind of uh, launch themselves into a lifestyle that they knew they wanted but they didn't know any other way to achieve um, things like that. So the you know, the, the courage of these women, their mistakes. I mean, um, several of these women abandoned children um, in order to pursue their passions, um, you know, not without heartache, not without regret, not without um, difficulty, just choosing that difficulty over another. Um, mental health is talked about in here in relation to motherhood, partnership and um, your vocation. Um, finding time, supportive family and partners versus unsupportive family and partners, um, travel, living a creative life, uh, all covered in this book. So um, I, I don't think you have to be a mother to or a parent to enjoy reading this. I think what it does really brilliantly is explain, like is explore this state of being. It's a state of being just like any other state of being. And um, this book really well um, explores the differences between um, 
like there's also a lot of intersectionality in here. So you have some women who are who are lesbians or bisexual. You have some women of color, um, women from different classes and backgrounds. And so access and how those things were accessed based on um, people's, you know, what they had at the time, where they came from, all those things are explored here. So really excellent highly recommend um this one and i'm really excited to talk about this uh for my thrive together network book club which um is happening on friday so uh yeah check it out hey everyone so i finished on immunity an inoculation by eula biss this morning and um this was a really interesting nonfiction book. It wasn't actually what I expected it to be. Uh, Eulabus is inspired or motivated by having her child to investigate our immune systems, vaccinations, um, and kind of the science around that. And she's motivated by her own um, health and the health of her child as he's growing to kind of learn more about how vaccinations are made um, and people's perception of them. So it's not really, I thought this was going to be a bit more about more specific to our immune systems and how our immunity is optimized maybe or something like that. But what she's examining here is kind of the social um, perceptions around vaccinations and around health, around disease, around infection, um, around what vaccinations have been, how they kind of evolved, and then how they interact with us um, as humans. The idea of herd immunity, the idea of um, humans protecting each other through vaccination um, and the perceptions of that. Also the equity of vaccination. So the fact that uh, one really good example she used was this one particular additive that um, the U.S. were contemplating removing from vaccines because of its of a certain of a certain quality that they felt that some studies made it seem like might be not optimal for health for the people receiving the vaccines. But then they realized that this additive is something that stabilizes a lot of vaccines and makes them not have to be refrigerated, which means that they can be shipped to wherever they need to be shipped to, the middle of Africa, anywhere and they can sit on a shelf and wait for the children to get to them to be vaccinated as opposed to taking that out which would make the vaccine more um, unstable and would mean it needs to be refrigerated and would mean it would be it would be accessed by less people and so that was a really interesting aspect of this book to, to think about access to think about um, the things that in western culture we or say, well, that's not healthy, we can't have that whatever compound in this certain thing. And we are inflicting that onto people who don't have the same access to healthcare, who don't have, um, you know, maybe an overarching governmental body that is making sure that these vaccines are being distributed because they live in a country that is not as developed or poor or lack access. And then we're kind of taking our health standards and inflicting them onto people who don't have the same luxuries we have. And so that was a really great point brought up in here as well. And I thought that there was a great balance between Eulabus's own thoughts and feelings and research and her own personal anecdotes, and then the science and not too much science at all, um, which made it better for me. Um, but enough science that she, you could tell that she researched very, very thoroughly uh, this book. So yeah, this is, it's not a long book. So, you know, for a science-based 
nonfiction. I think it's a really manageable size for you if you're looking for something. Um, this is obviously pre-COVID-19, but it's really interesting because she talks a lot about H1N1, which was um, a pandemic in the 2008, 2009 or something, 2007, around that time. And she talks about it and she talks about the WHO getting criticized for over-preparing. I just thought it was really interesting to read in this context now, knowing what we know about the WHO, knowing what we know about COVID-19, um, knowing that the coronavirus was already identified at this time and everyone knew that this virus could be, like that there would be another pandemic, there would be a pandemic, but when and all these things. So, you know, I think even though I'm reading it through um, someone who has been through COVID-19, who has had four vaccinations for that. Um, I think that it was still, there was still a lot of value in this because I think that the bigger questions that she's talking about in here about our responsibility to, not just to our own health, but to the health of humanity, is is important um and you know we have to there has to be a certain level of responsibility and um care for everyone not just ourselves when we're making these health decisions so it is our body but it's also not our body this kind of idea which i thought was really interesting so um yeah, so I thought this was really great. And oh, and the other thing that this book has, which I thought was really interesting, and is that she references Dracula by Bram Stoker a lot in here because she talks about it in relation to disease, like disease and a vampire and a vampire sucking out blood. And I thought that was really interesting and a really fun line that ran through the whole book. And because I'd read Dracula, I thought I was able to appreciate it even more. So you could read this having not read Dracula, but I think if you have and you have any interest in like health, science and um, immunity that you might want to read this because it has a really interesting take on the Dracula story. Um, she shared some interpretations of the Dracula story that I was not aware of. So I learned some stuff about that. And yeah, so I thought that was a really interesting um, way to share some of the um, underlying uh, fears around health, around immunization, around vaccination, is comparing it to the vampire's story and this, this monster. And um, yeah, it's got a great tie in. So. That's another reason that I'd recommend this. Uh, okay, so I will check in again with you when I have finished another book. Hey everybody. Okay, so I just finished Obasan by Joy Kogawa. It's hard to talk about this book. Um, it is very, very important to the history of World War II and the history of Japanese internment in Canada. I struggled a bit to continue to read this book and I think it's because it's an interesting mixture. It's a novel but you know that these things are real. You know that these things happened uh, to people and um, and happened to Joy Kogawa herself and so the way she kind of wove the characters together and the situations and shared the history um, felt at times like it was it's it's narrated in first person so it does feel like it's fic non-fiction but you know that it's a fictionalized version of these stories which was probably a more convenient way for her to tell the story she is a one, a beautiful writer there are some absolutely stunning passages and metaphors and um, sentences in this book. Um, I did find that for me at times there was a bit of um, a stop and start feel to it. Um, you are told the story through the perspective of Naomi 
and you start off with her, you know, sitting in her classroom as a teacher, as an adult in her mid thirties, and she here finds out that her uncle has passed away. And so she leaves the town that she works in and drives out to her aunt and uncle's home um, to be with her aunt. Obasan is his aunt in Japanese. Um, while uh, they wait for her brother and her aunt to arrive from t Toronto, they're coming. They're in Alberta. This, so this this is interesting because I read this as part of my British Columbia is my British Columbia pick for uh, reading across Canada. But it actually takes place more in Alberta than it does in British Columbia. Uh, well, I guess it's, it starts Vancouver. It takes place in northern northern BC. And then it moves to, to into Alberta. So it's it's very, it crosses over between the two. There's so many impressions that this book gives you about Japanese culture, about Japanese Canadian culture, about the absolutely unacceptable and deplorable way that Japanese Canadians were treated during the internment process and afterwards. They were not allowed back into British Columbia until 1949 and the war ended in 1945. Um, there's also a narrative in here that explains Nagasaki after the war, the bomb was dropped on it, which was, you know, devastating to read. And it's so important when you are talking about something like World War II, to have as many perspectives and as many narratives as possible, because what and and I find right now we're living in such a difficult time. There's war going on right now, and what when I read a book about World War II that is from a different perspective, it always teaches me that war is so has so many sides there's not just the good guys and the bad guys there's all these people in between most of the time they're just innocent people trying to live their lives and they're the ones that suffer the most from the decisions that are made by politicians and military leaders and um and oftentimes it's criminal what is done to them and there is no real apology or amends that you can make for putting people through this level of suffering. Um, so it was a very powerful book. It has really important statements to make about what it means to be a Canadian person, what it means to be from somewhere, move there, and then suddenly become the enemy. Or maybe you're the enemy the whole time. And, and this is very much explored in this novel, and I think it's done very, very well. Uh, the character of the brother I found really interesting because the sister, Naomi, the narrator, she um, is kind of ambivalent about her Japanese culture. So she, you know, she, her opinions about the way her aunt and uncle are, um, are... She just kind of accepts who they are, whereas the brother rejects his Japanese heritage and really isn't interested in eating Japanese food or talking Japanese language or like indulging in that part of who he is. He he feels he has to push it away, I think, in order to feel that he's actually Canadian. So there's some really interesting things going on in the dynamics of the family and in how they approach sharing information, the way the aunt and uncle try to shield their niece and nephew who they end up raising from the truth of what's happening in their family. So it is also like a family saga in a way with a lot of um, interpersonal relationships that are complicated and um, reflect a kind of, you know, new generation coming from the old country and adapting but not completely changing and all, all those different things which I always find really fascinating to read about so this is a really worthwhile read I think that um more people should read it um there is some controversy around Joy Kogawa which I just learned about um when I was 
um, looking up her home because her home in Vancouver that she lived in after she came back, I believe, from, I'm not sure, like as an adult, she lived in this home, I believe. But her father, um, who I believe is a character in this book loosely, um, was accused, he was a, he was a, an Anglican um, minister or priest, and he was uh, confessed to um, sexually molesting children when he was traveling and visiting families um, in his role. And so that has been a very devastating blow to the family, um, to his children, who I believe were not aware that this had happened. Um, and so it's, it's kind of put a lot of, um, there's a lot of pain and a lot of, um, um, you know, what everything that happens when something like this comes to light is associated around the family, unfortunately. Um, and so I don't think that in any way discredits this work by his daughter. I mean, she, she wrote this book. It's an important piece of historical, um, fiction that I think, should be read regardless of what her father did. Um, but it's just something that's kind of surrounding the, the, the museum itself, um, and the, the community that is, um, around. And there is a sequel to this book in which, um, I, I don't know if it's Naomi, the main character in which she, uh, chronicles her journey of the Japanese uh, community trying to uh, have the Canadian government address the wrongs done to them uh, at this time. So I don't know much about that history and I probably will Google that. I'm not sure if I'll read the second book or not. I will kind of, you know, let this one sink in and then see if I feel compelled to read it in future at some time. But I do think if you're interested in um, you know, history of World War II and um, what was happening here in Canada at that time. Uh, I think you should definitely read this. I think it gives a super important perspective that is not, again, is not something that's in the forefront when people are thinking about um, war narratives. And I will check in again with you when I have finished another book. Hey, everybody. So I just finished The Lesser Blessed by Richard Van Camp. This was my read for the Northwest Territories. This is actually the novella, The Lesser Blessed, and two short stories. Two or three short stories. Um, no, two short stories by Richard Van Camp. Uh, set in a fictional town in the Northwest Territories called Fort Simmer. Uh, and... This The stories all follow some of the same characters. Our main character in The Lesser Blessed is Larry. He lives with his mom and her sometimes on-again, off-again boyfriend, Jed. Um, and it's a coming-of-age story. It's set, I think they were, are probably in their second or last year of high school. And um, Larry is very obsessed by this girl named Juliet who is kind of the town uh, promiscuous girl for for lack of using the terms that I don't like using um, about women and their sexuality. Um, okay, so this is not, these are not my type of stories. Um, they were written in the 90s, I think, and there definitely is that kind of um, feeling of uh, like a toxic masculine environment that's going on here. We're also talking about indigenous communities where there's a lot of um, res of residual uh, trauma from residential schools and col colonization. So you have a lot of things resulting from that, but none of that is specifically addressed here other than the trauma that Larry himself uh, endures from his father, who is no longer really in his life. We also have Johnny, who's the new guy in town, who um, is quite narcissistic and self-obsessed, but we don't really find that out in The Lesser Blessed as much as a, a, a story further on. Um, yeah, so while I, I appreciate that I read this, um, I think that 
Richard Van Camp seems to write with a lot of humor and humor for me is is usually very tricky. I don't I don't really I think unless you are a part of a community where you you pick up the nuances of that speech and humor, um, I, I can't really pick it up because it's just not my community. And so I'm not familiar with the um, the nuance of it. So it doesn't come off as funny to me. And um, and as a just coming from my perspective in life, I just I, I couldn't really relate to the stories. I do appreciate that what they were trying to say. I think there is some very interesting weaving of indigenous storytelling. I certainly learned about some cultural things that I didn't know about because we're talking about indigenous people living in the north and I don't know very much about that at all. So that was interesting. There's not a lot of um, nature description or anything like that, other than to just kind of talk about um, the weather as it occurs, as it is affecting the characters as they go through um, their days. And yeah, so that's all I have to say. I, I, I can't say that I super enjoyed this. I, I definitely am glad I read it though. Um, and I think that... Um, it's it's a good uh, representation of of a of a Northwest Territories writer writing about his own community and probably writing for his community. I know that the Lesser Blessed has been turned into a film as well. I don't think the story was a was something that I would feel compelled to watch. Um, for me, the female characters were a bit too. Um, a bit too stereotypical. I did really like um, one of the characters, Kevin, in the short story called Where Are You Tonight? Um, I liked his grandmother. I thought she was very well, you know, a quick paragraph of, of the grandmother, but very well drawn. But Juliet, um, you know, I just, I just, I, I struggle with characters who are very beautiful, uh, you know, just want to have a baby and are very, um, you know, willing to have sex for recreational purposes only. Not that I'm judging that. That's just fine. Uh, women can do what they want with their bodies. But um, I just feel like there wasn't a lot of depth to her and um, I think I need that when you're talking about the only female character contemporary of all these male characters. So there were probably like seven men, male characters, all hanging out in this group. And Juliet was the only woman. And yeah. So that's my <laughs> opinion of The Let's Are Blessed. Uh, and I will check in again when I have finished another book. Hey, everybody. So I finished um, Not On My Watch by Alexandra Morton on audio. This book I've had on my TBR for quite a while. Alexandra Morton is a marine biologist who has worked most of her career out of um, a little sound up off of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. She is an, it was born in the United States, but um, wanted to study whales, moved here, I think in the mid seventies um, is the correct time, and started studying whales. From that study, she um, became interested in wild salmon. And that's because um, in the early eighties, the salmon farms, um, mostly owned by Norwegian companies, but also by other companies, started moving into that area. And the whales started leaving. And that led her to see that something was happening to the wild salmon populations and has continued her research to this day, as far as I'm aware. So this is her story. This is her uh, battle, really. Uh, she became an activist, whether she wanted to or not, trying to get the Department of Fisheries, part of the Canadian government, to acknowledge the detriment that salmon farms were having on the wild salmon population. Um, she dealt with a lot of, um, you know, 
uh, threats and arrests and um, she talks about her journey in um, understanding the indigenous peoples and their relationship to salmon but also how she needed to not take the lead on a lot of the activism but stand back and support indigenous uh, communities as they um, took up this fight for in a lot of cases their complete livelihood and their way of life and their spiritual um, cultural uh, integrity is all based on the salmon um, and so uh, you hear a lot about her scientific research. You hear about her family. Like, not, she doesn't go into extreme personal detail, but she definitely shares details of being a scientist, raising two children, um, her relationship with her late husband, um, how she lived very frugally, um, never, never making a lot of money or getting a lot of funding because the research she was doing was very much against the grain. The government didn't want to support it and these big salmon fa salmon farms didn't want to support it because they're making tons of money and they don't like the fact that she is finding things like sea lice and viruses in these fish um, and that is a direct cause of the salmon farm and the conditions of salmon farms and how fish are raised on salmon farms. So it's a really fascinating book. Um, it, <laughs> it definitely made me want to stop eating farm salmon. I don't eat a lot of farm salmon. Um, I think the only time I eat it is uh, when I have sushi. Um, and that's probably the worst uh, way to eat it. So um yep it is uh for some reason a controversial issue in a lot of cases but it's very much based in the science um her science and her integrity are were constantly and are constantly called into question um when she has no uh ulterior motive other than to protect the the natural ecosystems that um were in place that are being destroyed by industries coming in and uh, wreaking havoc in these communities um so really fascinating read i would recommend you listening to it or reading it if you have any interest in science nonfiction and in um in environmental um fiction and nonfiction. all right i'll check in again when i have finished another book Hey everyone. Okay, so I have finished my last book of November and that is Charm by Christine McNair. This is a poetry collection. And um, I was not really into this one, unfortunately. I, I read the, I really liked the cover um, when I, I bought this book secondhand. I really liked the cover. And then I thought that the description in the back was poems that I would like. Um, I think it was just her structures didn't work for me. I didn't find them. Um, I, what I look for in poetry is imagery. So words put together in a way that makes pictures in my head. I couldn't get any pictures from this because a lot of the poems were just words, you know, grouped together without any punctuation or um, without the poetry break, like the sentence breaks that um, help me with poetry, um, help me to form, you know, a, a cohesive thought. I just thought it was like a run on. A lot of them just felt like run on sentences to me. They just didn't work for me. So uh, that was a, a disappointment, but I will, I will pass this book on and hopefully someone else will find this and enjoy the poems in it. Uh, okay. So that was my reading for November. I uh, will check in again with you soon when I have another video. Thank you so much for watching.